We begin today with a keynote address from a noted expert in robotics and automation. He comes to us from the CEA Laboratory for Integration of Systems and Technology, where he is particularly active in the field of advanced manufacturing. He's a co-author of the book, Innovation in Aeronautics, and today will show us how progress in advanced manufacturing is already being inspired by the control systems work being done within accelerators and other large experimental physics institutions. He will also tell us about current and emerging technology trends in manufacturing and the industry changes they bring. Despite significant travel challenges, please welcome Dr. Gregorio Amayugo. Fantastic. So um, thank you very much. And um, I have to say it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to, uh, to be here today uh, after uh, a big conspiracy by, by the combined formidable forces of nature and French air traffic controllers that, <laughs> that tried to prevent me from, uh, from being with you here today. And uh, so, so I'd like to thank the organizers for, uh, for all their hard work in, in getting me together, uh, well, here together in one piece. So um, actually, to tell you a story, and, uh, and it's a, a story of uh, difficulty, of hope, and of uh, the impact that your work is already having uh, beyond uh, what is perhaps your, your, intended, uh, your intended domain. So in part, it's a story to make you feel proud of yourselves. So it's usually a good thing, because you're doing some excellent work that is being used in, uh, in other domains. And it's, it's also a, a call to arms. So um, if you do have some free time from the very important work that you're doing for the, uh, for the international scientific community, there are other people further down the pipeline, so uh, <laughs> working on, on technology development and, uh, and changing the manufacturing industry that could really benefit from, uh, from your expertise. And we're already doing that, so that's, that's part of the story today. So I guess this story today is one of uh, different worlds mixing together. There is a quote from uh, uh, Matsushita Konosuke, who was the, the founder of, uh, of Panasonic, that I like very much, and that embodies the spirit of the presentation that I'm going to make to you today. And what he says is that the best ideas, the best solutions to problems come from outside. And um, solving problems is a very human activity. It's much, much easier to solve problems if you have seen other worlds, other places. So I'm going to talk to you today about a different world that has many similarities with the world that you work in. Lots of mechatronic systems, lots of precision machinery, PLCs, often made by the same people. But it's also got big differences. There's a lot of grease and oil and noise. Well, you actually have noise. I've, I've been to Soleil. Uh, so, uh, but not so much the greasy, chaotic uh, side of it. So it's the world of factories and how we're trying to transform them into things that can better serve uh, society. So I, I thought I would play a little game uh, with you today. And then I realized that if there is one place in the world where I shouldn't play this game, it's, it's here. So guess which one is the, uh, the particle accelerator and which one is the factory of the future test bed. So you might think that we're talking about very different worlds, uh, where actually we do have many similarities. And um, OK, the one on top is right next to where I work. So that's, uh, that's Soleil. The one at the bottom is actually an advanced manufacturing testbed in Sheffield in the United Kingdom. And they ended up having a similar configuration by chance because they wanted different industrial partners to be able to test simultaneously or almost simultaneously new uh, manufacturing line configurations. So you have got all the computing firepower at the center, and then you've got different uh, experimental lines that are uh, radiating out. So if that sounds familiar, then you will understand uh, why there is a scope for crossover from the work that you're doing and the work that we are trying to do. And I'm going to simplify things a lot here. But, um, I mean, really, really a lot. If we look at the notion of human progress and how our society has evolved, uh, I take the view that, on one hand, you have scientific discovery that uh, either very quickly or very slowly changes things down the pipeline. Very often, you have technology development afterwards. And when we talk about technologies, we say, well, we're using these scientific principles to invent new things. 
to invent new machines, new uh, methods, so on and so forth. And eventually all of that reaches society. Uh, my, my thesis advisor many years ago in the, in the UK said well, all of technological progress sh should serve one of two things. And in reality, it's the same thing in the end. It's to be able to have richer lifetimes. So either these scientific discoveries and the technologies that are developed allow us to have longer lives directly, it's the case of, of medicine, so we can do more things in our lifetime, or in the same uh, lifetime we have, we can do more stuff, because we can travel further, because we have access to more information, and we're able to have richer uh, experiences. But it just so happens that all of these discoveries are enabled by the tools and instruments that are themselves the result of other scientific discoveries and of other technological uh, advances. And um, I have to say, and, and I think it's, it's important to say that um, a number of philosophers today are challenging this notion of progress. They're challenging this notion of progress because the relationship between science, technology, industry, and the benefit to society has become so complex that very often it's difficult to see what's in it for us uh, at the end. So um, I'm going to make a lot of emphasis on that uh, afterwards. Uh, but very often the work that you do to develop instruments, whether it's the telescope, the microscope, or particle accelerators that are enabling big scientific discoveries, in a very human way, they are used for uh, other things by other communities and by other people. The tale that I'm going to tell you today is a tale of using something that you guys developed uh, for another purpose. It's helping a lot, and I think there's, there's a scope to do, uh, to do much more together. And uh, very often, this unintended use of technology and, and of science uh, happens a long time afterwards. You'll see in my final slide a very, very silly example of a technology that was invented many thousands of years ago that has just found uh, a new use. So there is always scope uh, to keep mixing things together and, and to keep inventing things. And what we're talking about when we say Industry 4.0, because all of advanced manufacturing today is gravitating towards this notion, Industry 4.0. We're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And um, I feel I should explain this, because you, you might know about it already, but there are fights amongst the manufacturing community, whether, whether we are actually in 3.0, 4.0, or, or something else. Very often uh, in Europe, there is uh, a French-German fight, and we will not call the Industrial Revolution the same thing as the German. So uh, I'll go with, with what's more common. So that's Industry 4.0, the fourth Industrial Revolution. At the beginning, man made stuff. We made things with our own energy, with our own power, and uh, also helped along by animals. And that covers most of history, actually, uh, up until very recently, when we learned to harness the, the energy in coal, and then using vapor to actually make machines that would replace this human or, or animal uh, labor, like Thompson & Thompson, by machines. That created the first industrial revolution because suddenly we were able to do things that people couldn't have done. We were able to make more products, make faster, and we had the first factories. So it took a long time to get to this first industrial revolution, a lot of serendipity. But after this first one, the second one came rather quickly, just about 100 years later. And then we harnessed the power of electricity. So instead of making these huge machines, we were able to downsize them, to make things a bit more modular, and actually rethink the way these factories ran. So the second industrial revolution is that of assembly lines. We began to make cars. This is around the time when petrol began to, uh, to be used. The third industrial revolution came much faster. So you can see the accelerating pace. and. Uh, and this morning, my, uh, my boss was, uh, was asking me in a conf call, uh, can we talk about the fifth one for <laughs> in about 10 years? So um, the fourth one is uh, that of robotics. We learned to change the mechanical complexity of machines because we had harnessed the electron by electronic complexity. And so we could make 
many, many more things. This is the world of PLCs. This is the world of plastics. This is really the world that we live today because industry is just beginning to transform itself. What's commonly accepted is that the fourth industrial revolution has just begun in around 2008, 2009. And it is a, a revolution that comes from connectivity, connecting machines together, connecting machines and people, connecting entire factories together, generating huge amounts of data that are then harnessed to make these machines, these factories, adapt to new needs faster and serve society faster. So it is the uh, revolution of the hyper-connected world. And there are, aren't many companies that, that have harnessed this already. Uh, large companies are beginning to do this, but they have big, big value chains that are made up of tiny companies that are struggling with this. So I've just said it's a revolution that's enabled by connectivity. It's enabled by digital technologies. And there are a number of technologies that have been identified, very often working together. Sometimes it's a subset of these technologies that are behind this revolution. So in terms of connectivity, you have the Internet of Things. You have mobile internet. You have cloud, which actually gives you access to computing resources in a way that you, you didn't have before. So you can decouple what you need to do physically with the calculations that, uh, that you need to do um, uh, in the background. You've got advanced robotics technologies. You have additive manufacturing energy. And many of these technologies are being driven by the discoveries, by uh, materials characterization that are done at the facilities that you guys run. So um, you're already part of this, whether you know it or not. And what are we trying to do with this? So, um, is it a, a techno push revolution? It's, it's actually pulled by a societal need, by a market need. Because these same technologies are also changing us. Even changing us physiologically. I'll, I'll say a couple of words uh, about that uh, at the end. So people need different things today than they needed before all this stuff came along. And what that means for people who want to make things is that they need to be more flexible, more agile, and change the products that they make faster in order to better serve people. And what's in it for us? And I'm going to tell you a little story. And this is a true story. I'm not going to say any names. And actually, I could, because it's no shame. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about a big French multinational that makes products and has realized that the market changes faster and faster. They cannot keep up, but they have a wonderful market forecasting department. And they say, we think that in a few years' time, people are going to love this. We're going to make a different product with a different color, a different shape, different functionalities, a different subcomponent. And so they do their job. They're getting focus groups, customers, yeah, I like this, I don't. And they make a big uh, report to the head of the company. And they said, we should launch this product. And said, OK, go ahead and design the product. So they get a big team of people, and they start designing the product. They look at what's available, because nobody manufactures things by themselves anymore. It's always an ecosystem of a big company somewhere. Often it's not even that. And a big constellation of smaller companies that make components and, and, and sub-products that have to go in there. So they start by themselves. They begin getting their suppliers in the loop. They co-design the product, do co-innovation. And at some point in time, they say, OK, we're going to freeze this. And now we're going to change our manufacturing facilities to get this product out on the market. So they design, very often, they design new factories. At the very least, it's new assembly lines. And then all of these people that are involved down the line, all the suppliers, they have to do the same. And they have to get to a point where they begin to produce the prototype version of this. So the um, small suppliers, they make little parts. And for the very first time, they arrive at the big factory. It's usually in secret. They don't make big ceremonies, because very often parts don't fit together <laughs> the first time around. <laughs> but. Then they tweak it. They fine tune it. They do this for a, a few months until they say, wow, we did it. We're now able to roll this product out on the market. But the market has moved on. 
the particular company that I'm talking about, from the time they freeze design to the time the first product comes out of the factory, it's three years. And nobody waits three years for a product anymore. So they try to time the campaign to create market needs. But what's happening today is that the wonderful factories they had designed, very automated to drive costs down, to get quality up, they run at one third capacity. They usually fire two thirds of the people that they had hired. They realize that the big empty factory that they have today with the one third of people that are left, they're all alone in a corner. They have to run across the factory to, uh, to see what's happening. It's, it just doesn't work anymore. So when that happens, and it happens more and more often and in more and more markets, big companies, big companies lose money. Small companies don't lose money. They go bankrupt. And that's a big problem. It's a big problem because the reality is that although they might not make the news so often, most of our jobs and uh, most of our growth comes from small companies. So small companies have much, much more trouble to, to adapt to this new reality, both in the sense of changing market preferences and the technologies that they could be implementing to adapt. And that is first because it's much more difficult for them to keep abreast with new technology developments. I've met many, many heads of small companies that have heard about Industry 4.0, but for them it's just a fluffy concept and completely disconnected with the reality of the 100 people that they have to feed in, the, in their factory. Then they don't have the money because new technologies require significant investment. And finally, they cannot take the risk. Very often, all of these small companies as I've just said in the example, they're working for a larger one. They're links in a chain. And there are chains, especially in Europe, where we have structural problems relative to, uh, to other markets. We have high labor costs, and so on and so forth. It's already extremely tight. They cannot take the risk to say, hmm, what would happen if I change this uh, machine uh, and, and put some, some robots instead? They, they, don't, they do not have that leisure. We could take the view that that is the way things go. Big companies will adapt. We will lose these small companies, and something will come to replace this. And that we should just embrace the digital revolution as it is. But there is a fundamental problem, and that is that it's much more difficult to move atoms than bits. If the digital revolution means we're moving more bits than atoms, it means that it's easier to create new businesses, it's easier to create new wealth, but it's so much easier to take it all away. So for the time being, and I say for the time being, uh, being able to have a manufacturing base is still very important to generate wealth and prosperity. If we can generate that manufacturing wealth in our countries, in a uh, frame where uh, environmental regulations are respected, uh, it's even better for, for everyone. And I will not go into that in this talk. This could change in the, in the next 10 or 20 years as we move towards a sharing economy because this same digital revolution is enabling more and more people to come together, uh, more and more services to be provided seamlessly. We could be moving towards a model where people don't own things anymore. I think Autolib or, or the, uh, the bikes that, that you can have. And that actually means in terms of cars, if you use car sharing, you make 10 times less cars. But then you still need to maintain, repair. There are other challenges with manufacturing. It's still important to have a manufacturing base. Because it's easier to move bits than atoms, we will not be silly and think that we could keep all the factories in our countries. Factories will move where the market is. Growing markets today are in the emerging world. So the goal could be to either make things that we use or to make the things that will help make the things. So if we make the machines, if we have an industrial base that is leading from the background this industrial revolution, we will still be able to generate wealth and prosperity. So just a, um, a little aside, why am I so obsessed with all this? Because um, 
I work for CEA, for the French Atomic Energy Commission. I'm sure that many of you know uh, about it. I don't work uh, so much with atoms, actually. And what you might not know is that within CEA, there are four and a half thousand people uh, that only work in the uh, nuclear field and in the large research infrastructure fields a little bit. We make robots for maintenance at the uh, LMJ and, uh, and ITER and things like that. But the bulk of our work is developing technology and transferring it to industry. So it's a, uh, a, completely, uh, a completely different uh, mission. And uh, in the institute where I work, we work on digital technologies, robotics, and so forth, uh, we are actually very, very active in trying to lead a transformation of, of industry in France. So we are co-founders of the National Industry of the Future Alliance, and we have launched a number of initiatives to try and get not only large companies, but all of these small companies to adopt technologies faster, to make it easier for them. So the story that I'm going to tell, tell you now um, is about one of these initiatives. And um, I had the uh, good fortune uh, well, luck, it was just sheer luck to, to be able to conceive this particular baby and, uh, and to lead its, uh, its deployment. And what I thought is um, you cannot lead this type of initiative from a technology point of view. Look at what robots are going to do for you. That, that doesn't work. So we started from the other end. What did we want to accomplish? So we want to accelerate the deployment of new technologies so that they make a difference in factories. But we need to get all these uh, SMEs, and SMEs won't take risks because they're in value chains. This is what we just said. So let's get the whole value chain. If we get the guys that they sell to in the same room, and they say, if you actually change this, I'm going to buy it, then it becomes much, much easier for them to take the risk. So we tried to think of a test bed where we could demonstrate this type of things with entire value chains and as many of them as possible, and demonstrate what it really comes down to is changing production lines faster and cheaper, more cheaply, to either put different products on the same manufacturing line, or change the production rate, make it faster, make it slower. And of course, me being Spanish, I couldn't have it any other way. We gave it a Spanish name. It's called Floor. And uh, Floor means the future factory at Lorraine. So it was the, this was a French region where we, uh, where we set up the platform. So what is this platform? We actually had to go through the excruciating process of um, renting space in an actual factory, where they say, if, if your robots run away and they go into the factory, it will be your head <laughs> if they stop production. So we rented 1,000 square meters in a Peugeot uh, factory in the east of France. We wanted to do it in a factory. Peugeot is just one of the partners. Uh, but first of all, to uh, subject ourselves to the same constraints and regulations that you will have in factories afterwards. And I can tell you that uh, getting connectivity, and especially wireless <laughs> connectivity in there, was a big, big nightmare with a commission that takes two years to say whether you can put Wi-Fi or not. So that's, that's the reality of factories today, even in, 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 the advanced, uh, in the advanced manufacturing sector. And we built an infrastructure that had already state-of-the-art equipment to make it flexible, both in terms of hardware and in terms of software. So we could run, we could run experiments faster. We could do things for different uh, industries, but also demonstrate how fast it could be to change between, I'm going to make a car engine, and even I'm going to make a piece of furniture So in, in assembly lines. So the goal was to do all of that and um, create working groups where you could put together uh, the end users, the guys that have factories, with providers in their value chains and try and make demonstrations of what these new systems could be. It took some difficulty convincing the people at CEA because uh, we're usually in a techno push mode. We make technologies, we want to transfer them. And here we're entering a paradigm where if the people around the table can come up with a solution without us, there will be a um, business created for them, but not for us. 
So what I told my boss is that we're actually spiders that are waiting in the web for, for real research opportunities to come. <laughs> and he seemed to like that. We took the opportunity to uh, also uh, change the way that we were going to run the experiment. And um, in my previous life, I, uh, I also had the good fortune to pioneer a new uh, rapid prototyping uh, approach at Airbus that actually helped us to, um, to do spiral development of, of hardware. In, in new areas, so we've done that uh, as well to try and make it even more, interest for com more interesting for companies so they will not have to, uh, to wait uh, two or three years before uh, the results can reach the, the factory. So where are we now? Uh, we inaugurated the platform at the end of uh, January. Uh, we involved a number of partners uh, from across Europe so uh, providers of uh, equipment, providers of software and digital platforms, and especially the people who have factories. We've launched a number of working groups. We've uh, already put together a number of demonstrators. And now we're trying to build more and more complex pilot lines that we're going to be able to reconfigure. And how do we do all that? Well, it just so happens that we had a source of, of inspiration. There are actually a number of common problems that, that we have. First one is we both need uh, cyber physical systems. We need to make them flexible. We need to make them modular. You need to run lots of experiments that have very, very stringent requirements. At the end of the day, we're going to need to have high quality and high precision in what we do as well. And the big question is, how fast can we make it adapt? Like, how fast can we reconfigure these things? We have PLCs, even though now that there is some drive in, in industry to get rid of PLCs altogether to make it even more modular. So, but the reality today is that at the end of the day, we have the same suppliers in both worlds. Even the same, uh, well, same supplier, same brand, same type of, of PLC. Where we didn't have, is, in this particular case, Tango. And as usual, <laughs> the real story is a human story. So how did this come about? When we started putting this together for real, I had the, uh, the good fortune to, um, to steal one of your colleagues, <laughs> so uh, Pascal Bettinelli who actually sends out a big hug to all of you. <laughs> so um, She's in floor uh, today, uh, running one of these groups. And uh, she came to, uh, to the technology development branch of, uh, of uh, CEA. She looked at what, what was available in industry and what we were trying to do, and she was horrified. <laughs> she said, you have to come to Soleil. I'm going to show you how real things are done, how work is done properly, how you can do reconfigure. The whole, the whole works. And, and actually, you can see her here with a, a wrench demonstrating what a factory worker uh, would be doing to, to set up, uh, well, to, to assemble a motor to the CEO of, uh, of Peugeot and the industrial director of, uh, of Peugeot. And, um, and our collective boss, who is just on top of the KUKA robot there, said, I bet you've never seen a factory worker with a PhD. And, <laughs> but uh, I'll get back to that at the end of the presentation, because there is an interesting theme uh, behind there. So I am very, very much indebted to, uh, to Pascal. What happened? Well, she got Nexeya in and said, you know what? We know that there are things that we will not be able to deploy in industry. But there are things that have worked for us at the Sancratron. And we have the same problem. We need to um, get both uh, hardware and software reconfigured really easily. We have a services uh, approach. You can just tick boxes. You can say, OK, I get a new sensor, a new camera. We can test that very quickly. It's the same things that we needed to do in floor. So uh, what I think is really record time she managed to, uh, to get the system up and running. And now I'm, I'm happy to say that Floor runs on Tango. And um, it's working well. I'm going to show you an example, an actual example uh, that, that we're doing for a, for a factory uh, using that. And um, there is, of course, the big question, what happens afterwards? But for this advanced manufacturing research facility, there is no doubt that it's doing wonders for us. That's not to say that. This type of tools don't exist 
in the manufacturing world. You have big actors, including Siemens, that say, yeah, we can do that for you. They're all closed. There's no open source uh, stuff. They're, you have to pay for all of that. And you have a very turbulent environment where there are different actors trying to impose their standards. So I don't know what the long-term future will be. I don't know if, if Tango could find its way into uh, every factory in the world. I think at the very least, the, the concepts that we are using there are going to, um, to be deployed one way or another, even by these uh, industrial companies. And uh, we've actually built a number of, of bridges between Tango and industrial uh, systems architectures. So um, today, if you wanted to deploy it in a factory, we're not so far, far off from being able to do that. So just a couple of examples. And uh, the, the first example is really interesting. Uh, I often say this. It's, it's a bit tongue in cheek. It's the first concrete result of the platform, uh, but before we inaugurated it. So um, Pascal had just uh, created some requirements to, um, to put equipment on the platform. And a number of companies had, uh, had competed for that, and we were building the platform. And then I was asked by a number of French regional governments to help them audit their uh, small, uh, medium-sized uh, industry tissues. So how far they were automated, whether the, we could put more robots in, uh, more manufacturing execution systems, so on and so forth. So I saw many, many companies. And one day, I found myself in Toulon, in the, in the south of France. And I was going to audit a machining workshop. So it's a shack. It's a metal shack with eight guys inside. And they got together, and, and they bought a number of, of machines just to make metal pieces. <laughs> so I was not expecting much. I said, uh, I'd be really happy if, if they were using Excel to track the, the number of pieces they had made. So we had a little chat. They, they gave me a coffee. And then we went into the, uh, into the shack. And suddenly, <laughs> instead of seeing the, the eight people loading and unloading the machines, I saw this. So you had a, um, a mobile collaborative robot with no uh, barriers, no cages, so one of these uh, new technology, uh, new um, advanced manufacturing technology uh, gadgets, uh, plugging in to the machines, opening its belly up, taking out raw pieces of metal, putting them in the machine, boop, pressing the button, waiting, and once it was finished, it opened the machine, it opened its belly, it put it back, and it started again. And I said, there's no way you're doing this. You're eight people. <laughs> and he said, well, you know what? We have a really good integrator. I said, really good integrator. Because at the end of the day, most SMEs, most small companies, they turn to their integrator when they want to innovate. They don't come to big research and technology organizations. So he said, you know what? They're debugging, so I'll, I'll let you meet them. I said, well, how did you get the idea of, uh, of doing this? So are you local? He said, no, no, we are in the east of France. I said, oh, OK. Uh, who do you work for? I said, I work for CEA. Ah, have you heard about Floor? It's this awesome thing they're building in the end. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. I know. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, there was this, this big call for, uh, for proposals uh, for equipment, what Pascal Bettinelli wrote. And we tried. We, we bid for it, and uh, we failed. We didn't make it. But we thought the idea was cool, so we made our own. <laughs> and uh, and it ha I have to say that this is a, uh, maybe a critic on, on, public, uh, on public initiatives and, and civil servants, that uh, in the time it took them to fail to make the platform and uh, create the new product and start going out to trade shows and selling it, because they were selling it to, to many companies, we still hadn't inaugurated the damn thing. <laughs> So when, when I go meet with local governments, I tell them, look, what we're doing is wonderful. But I don't say this too loud in front of my boss, because <laughs> he says, that should have been us uh, there. But the reality of things, so th this is a really nice story, because okay, here they did not use Tango. They made their own thing. But they tried to, uh, to achieve uh, modularity, uh, both mechanical and uh, and digital modularity in order to allow a robot to, to go from machine to machine to, uh, to, to service them. The real story is that the, the owner of this little workshop now runs the machines at night. 
and he runs them in the weekends. He says he's praying because there are no regulations regarding <laughs> running collaborative robots in the weekends and what, what should happen if his shack catches fire and um, nobody can give him an answer, uh, least of all his insurer. Uh, but now he's, he's increased productivity by 50% and he hasn't fired anyone. So the eight people he had loading, unloading, loading, unloading, doing boring mechanical work, they've actually cleaned up the shack and now they are looking at ways that they could expand. So maybe if we put these two things together, uh, we could make, instead of just raw components, we could make some sub-assemblies. We could go and, um, and address new markets. And now they're able to compete internationally, which they weren't before. So it's a success story. And now the more official <laughs> success story that we uh, started building in parallel is not so different. Um, so this is actually a, uh, a furniture factory in the east of France that is already more or less automated. They were automated already. They've been automated for a long time. And what they realize now, they actually make bathroom and kitchen furniture, <coughs> is that they cannot sell bathroom and kitchen furniture for more than a couple of months before the, uh, the big um, distributors say, we want a new model but their factory is already automated and they don't have the money to make an investment. So they try to automate part of it at the end. They, they manage to get uh, one of these robotic cells for palletization. When it breaks down, it's over for them. They cannot get anybody in and production breaks down and they've had a lot of teething problems. So what they've done is they've put a parallel manual line and trying to get people to put everything together in kits. It's, it's this type of companies that we hate when we get, when we get home in, in the weekend and have to open the, the cardboard box and spend uh, six hours. And, and like IKEA, there's always a screw missing. But it's often down to them, to these poor people that are being overworked, trying to put together all these pieces inside. So the problem they have is an automated line that is not flexible and a manual line that is not productive and quality is low. And there we did use Tango. And we showed how you could put together uh, in the existing system, so plugging in uh, to the existing control architecture, a modular uh, mobile robot-based concept where they work together with people. The things that robots could do are done by robots. The things that people can do and robots cannot are done by people. And the resulting hybrid line is actually more productive and uh, more productive than the automated line. <laughs> and uh, well, the quality is better, better and it's more flexible. I say it's more productive because when it breaks down, they just unlock the robot wheels. They take it out and they put a person, which you cannot do with traditional automation. So we've run a, diff a number of different configurations and uh, we've used Tangle for that. And, and, and we're running a pilot at the factory now. We already demonstrated it in floor. So there you go, that's a real use. Now, that's what we're doing in the factory today. What's next? So what's around the corner, at least in terms of uh, advanced manufacturing? And we're taking the view now that the next big thing, and that's why my boss this morning was saying, industry 5.0, industry 5.0, <laughs> it's artificial intelligence. When I say artificial intelligence, I'm, I'm not trying to, um, to hype it up. I'm just talking about machine learning. I'm talking about the possibility to use large sets of complex data to make models that we would not have been able to make ourselves, to make models that can actually respond to a range of input conditions, and what this means, even for SMEs, is that say, um, one of them told me uh, very recently, um, you know what, I could model my production process. Uh, there are a few companies that have told me they can do that, but the license is hundreds of thousands of euros. I'll never pay that. But I have big quality problems, and uh, I cannot change my configuration fast enough. Well, if you could just have a camera looking at the output, connected to the cloud, because you're not going to put data centers in, in small manufacturing companies, and then run machine learning algorithms on that, it's actually a very simple problem to solve. So there is a big potential impact of artificial intelligence in, uh, in manufacturing, and to actually improve the flexibility of, of these factories. 
not necessarily to, to replace humans, because uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the fear hype is seldom uh, materialized in the long run. But the interesting thing is that today, the impact of these technologies is on non-physical things. And uh, this year I ran the, um, I, I hosted the Smart Manufacturing Summit in Paris. I, I try and do that every year just to, uh, to keep my, uh, my pulse on the new startups that are coming up. So we host a, a startup uh, competition. Up until last year, the 10 finalists were all robotics manufacturers. So, yes, advanced manufacturing is new robots. This year there was not a single one in the top 10. <laughs> and I was shocked. All of them were artificial intelligence companies. Why? Because it's actually a very simple concept to put into, um, into play. You make your neural network, you find the problem that the other guys have, you plug the inputs, you make it learn, and you say, ta-da. But the ta-da today is not physical. We're talking about heuristics. God forbid you put that in a large uh, experimental <laughs> research facility. <laughs> You don't know what the output is going to be. But we're actually working on new ways to, to achieve certification of, uh, of these systems. For the time being, it's already making an impact. It's twice what it was uh, last year in terms of business in Europe, but only for vision systems, uh, control systems that do not lead to physical action. We think that is going to change very quickly. And we hope that industry, and I'm not talking about GAFA, but the manufacturing industry is going to be able to play a role into that, otherwise we'll be swept away by, by this revolution. In France, there is now an ambitious plan that has been uh, put into place to act both in terms of R&D, in terms of creating new companies that could serve the industry and could deploy these type of systems quickly. And the very first initiative that was launched in March uh, was actually, uh, it's called DigiHall now, and uh, I'm happy to say that we are federating that. So we're creating a, a digital innovation hub to deploy artificial intelligence in factories uh, across France. And also in autonomous cars, by the way, because <laughs> it's the same technologies that are behind uh, many, many of the revolutions now. So I said earlier that we're changing physiologically. At the end of the day, well, I'm, I'm just talking about economics here. So um, companies that are going to be able to grow, uh, so new, new activity. What's in it for humans at the end? It's no good if we have wonderful economic activity and there's no humans anywhere anymore. And we actually hear some, some people in the West Coast, uh, in the US saying that this is going to happen and uh, that this should be the case. Now, I can feel that because I'm also a geek, but <laughs> I mean, eliminating every other human being uh, in the world should not be the aim. In, in the end, we should be doing this for ourselves. So what's in it for humans? And um, humans that are changing already. I had a talk with, with an Israeli uh, psychologist this summer that said we, are, we have lost five IQ points uh, collectively uh, since 2008. Uh, interestingly, uh, the beginning of Industry 4.0. And we're changing physiologically, in part thanks to our smartphones. So this technology that we have around us is becoming smarter and smarter, and it's taking over cognitive functions that we used to have ourselves. So the end system is better than a human, a, a 2.0 human or a 1.0 human, which could still beat uh, the crap out of the, the new human, by the way, because we don't exercise anymore. But the human side of this system, where you combine technology and biology, is uh, actually worse. And that should not be the aim. So apart from turning on uh, vibrat vibration and notification in all your phones, if you do that, uh, she has assured me, you will gain five IQ points within a week. So <laughs> I did that on my phone already. <laughs> so what's, what's the end game for us, for us humans in all this? And um, I hear a lot in France, I mean, with, with all the trade union uh, history that, that we have, uh, we get a lot of this. Is robots are going to steal our jobs. Robots are bad things. Everything focuses around robots because there is the mythology of something that looks like a human, whereas a special machine <laughs> was already taking over jobs that uh, robots were, uh, jobs that humans were doing before. Let's look at what happened to agriculture. Turn of the century in the 1900s, half of the population of France worked in the fields, on their force, 
plucking potatoes out uh, of the field all day long. And yes, if you have a creative disposition that can allow you to be somewhere else. But isn't that a pity? A few years ago, I accompanied my, my wife, who's in the environmental field, uh, uh, to the southeast of Spain, in Murcia, where they have big problems with water and, and trying to see what, um, what could be done to help uh, agriculture there. And one of the uh, farmers, I mean, uh, most of them, we, we met them, they had big calloused hands and they were all uh, very tired. You could see that they were tired, that they had spent a lifetime trying to labor. And one of them actually told us, no, uh, we're not gonna go to my farm, let's meet in the city center. In the city center? <laughs> so we went to the city center of, of Totana, so this is in, uh, in Murcia, and the guy had an office, and he was just laying back with his feet up on the table, and he said, well, welcome to my farm. I said, what? So he had grapes, uh, he, he had a number of, of crops there, and, uh, and he had a, um, well, one of these minority report uh, types, uh, HMI, and he said, well, you know what? I, uh, I actually have a degree in computer science, but what I really wanted to do is farming. I've automated most of it, and look at that. Uh, my, uh, my grapes are drying out a little bit. So I go, chuk, 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 chuk. there you go. I've just increased uh, the, uh, <laughs> the amount of water that they're going to get uh, through the dripping system. And okay, here we need a bit more minerals, so tick, 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 tick. And, uh, and he was running the entire farm from the city center. And he, he's actually making a good living. So we don't have 50% of the population working in the farms anymore. You could say Industry 4.0 hasn't still, hasn't yet reached farms. But some of them are beginning to implement this sort of thing. In the US, I have seen farmers sitting uh, at the side of their field, uh, like the uh, sorcerer's apprentice uh, running a number of tractors that are uh, prancing up and down, and, uh, and they're just sitting around <laughs> doing nothing. And you have 3% of the population that is working on, on agriculture today. Yet we're managing to feed many more people than we did before. If you look at population growth, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to destroy a bunch of jobs. It just means that the population will keep growing and you will need more people than you have today. The people that remain, though, will be doing more human jobs. So maybe the end game here is leave robot, ro robot jobs to robots and human jobs to humans. We could ask for the same thing to take place in factories, from a paradigm where we do mindless jobs all day long to one, I've actually seen this. I, I met this guy. He's, uh, uh, working in one of uh, the uh, factories of uh, SEW, one of the partners of, uh, of Floor. And uh, it's not a completely automated factory. There are people uh, running, uh, they're assembling motors, actually, <laughs> motors and PLCs, so <laughs> they're making the bricks to make uh, Industry 4.0. And he has got, again, one of these minority report uh, type of interfaces where he can see where all the people are, what the people are doing, where all the uh, automated guided vehicles are that are taking parts for them to manufacture. They can see if one of the guys is having trouble, so he uh, just touches the screen and says, whoop, I'll reroute the AGV to someone else. We're going too fast slow down everybody, so the, uh, the automated systems slow down, the robots go a bit slower, and the people that are working get a little warning, uh, slow down, because you're going too fast. And uh, also, uh, well, you need to go faster, tam tam, <laughs> and he does the same thing. And they're running the factory at a, in a very fluid way. I think that that's something that's worth uh, aiming for. And at the end of the day, and I told you I was gonna get back to, uh, to the example, <laughs> I'll talk about that in, ju in just one second. Uh, we are wired when we're born to explore, to create, to find new problems and solve them and get a kick out of that, to, to imagine. And for the past couple hundred years, Montessori schools notwithstanding, we have been educated to become links in a chain. Because education came around more or less at the same time as the, as the first industrial revolution. Before that, it was just little um, little outfits uh, in the corner of a castle or in a monastery and so on and so forth. So maybe what we should be aiming for is a future where, yes, we have done automation. There are jobs that are not there anymore. We are building our little castle of cards, but humans are sitting on top of all of that to do human stuff. And there's nothing more human than looking for solutions to difficult problems. Because there we're exploring, we're experimenting, we're creating and we're imagining. There is 
Also, no more human uh, activity than the saying, hey, I have a solution. Let's see what problem I can, I can solve with that. So um, I told you that some inventions uh, are still being used to solve problems 10,000 years after they were invented. And there you have the chair. So the chair was invented a while ago, but we're still finding new uses for that in a scientific context. I guess my message to do today is go out and meet people from other domains, maybe even more different than Industry 4.0, uh, more different than factories. There is a lot of things that you can bring to the table and maybe a lot of ideas that they could bring to you. And I don't even know why I'm saying this because you're already doing it. I've had the luck to work with, with Pascal, who is a member of your community, and we're doing wonderful things. She misses you. <laughs> Factories are, uh, are no place for scientists today. But maybe in the future, the jobs that you're going to have in factories are going to be for scientists who are going to be running these uh, creative, flexible uh, systems. So let's try and aim for that future. Uh, that's where I end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregorio. So we have time for some questions. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, some people have proposed that the, the state should tax robots, like Bill Gates, for example. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it's a barrier for the development of this? Ah, that's a wonderful, a very, very interesting uh, discussion that, uh, that I have quite often with, with people from both sides. Um, I, I think it's a mistake. And taxing the use of something that's going to make you uh, more efficient just because someone has a, a primeval fear, a primal fear that, uh, that there are jobs that are going to go away is, is not the right approach. The reality I see on the field is seldom uh, one where uh, jobs are destroyed. I'm not saying it doesn't happen because you do have factories that say, well, we automate everything. But I think eventually it all leads to uh, to new job creation. There is a beautiful thing they do in, uh, I think it's a Nissan in, in Japan. Every time they put a robot in the factory, they write down the name of the guy it replaced and the guy's phone number and a new position, so you can check on him. Now, I don't know if they have a call center <laughs> for that, but um, I think it's a good approach to say, okay, yes, we're automating it, we're, we're becoming more efficient, uh, but we, we're also taking care of the human side, and, and we know that this is a human endeavor. It's not just one guy that wants a big, a big factory for himself. I think in the long run, what is going to, uh, to happen, if you have more and more efficient manufacturing, because at the end of the day, this means that products will be cheaper. So what should happen once forces reach an equilibrium? And what we have to hope is that they will not reach an equilibrium through a bloody revolutionary process, which has often happened in the past, um, is that things will be cheaper for all of us. So you could say, well, the value of labor relative to uh, what, you, what you have to buy what, what, uh, uh, is going to change. And it's a lot easier for us to eat meat today than it was 100 years ago through the automation uh, of, uh, of agriculture. But I think we will see emerge some uh, new policy initiatives that, that, should be, um, that should be interesting, not taxing, but the other way around, so providing incentives to, to keep people. For example, if companies didn't have to pay taxes anymore to have people. Imagine uh, if you have that, then it becomes much cheaper to employ a person, and you can uh, find a new equilibrium, because uh, at the end of the day, we don't put robots because we like seeing robots. It's just in terms of efficiency. I think most people like seeing people, although sometimes I wonder in McDonald's when, uh, when I, I go to the new um, screen rather than go up to the counter. But um, I think eventually there will be some, some re-equilibrium, some new policies. Uh, I think taxing things because we're scared of them is not the right approach. All that's going to do is, is going to make the places where this is deployed, this policy that, that you're talking about, less efficient. I know we had a, a Benoit Hamon in France that, uh, that proposed putting this in place, a big tax, and then pay a uh, reasonable salary to everyone for doing nothing. I think that leads very quickly to dystopia. We have no incentive to do anything at all. That's then I heard a professor at MIT that says that people will eventually pay to work. 
So <laughs> you have, <laughs> jury is out on that one. Um, I know I want. <laughs> Anyone else? Here we have a question here from Eric. Thank you. So one of the secrets to our success is collaboration, uh, going to these meetings, open source, things like that. Um, do you see that kind of uh, uh, paradigm? Well, that does seem some, somewhat antithetical to the competitive nature of, of most industries. So would you see industries now becoming more collaborative, or do you think they even need to, as long as we're collaborative? <laughs> That's an excellent question. I, I would say today it's, it's a pool full of sharks. Actually, they're not collaborative at all. So even getting people um, in floor, what we, what we did is we tried to get no direct competitors. And uh, you might have seen some names. We, we didn't manage to, uh, to get that. But in order to allow them to be relatively open, say, well, at the end of the day, we are working for you in everyday life. We could move forward together. But there are big fights, and um, I know for sure there is a lot less collaboration uh, around the topic of Industry 4.0 than what you have here. That's what allows you to move forward the way you do. Because it's, at the end of the day, it's not money that's driving you. Um, that could change. And one of the things they, um, I think it's Rifkin that's, uh, that's saying this at the moment, is that we're going to see more and more self-organizing networks. So, if you take into account things like additive manufacturing, where you can make complex parts without putting into place a, a big um, mechanical <laughs> outfit, a big uh, production line, then it becomes easier for people who invent things to uh, make them and to uh, go on, online and find uh, a number of, uh, of people that would be willing to uh, make subcomponents for them. So uh, I think we're not there yet. I've begun to see this sort of initiative for simple products. But uh, if we move towards more and more self-organized networks of people, of, of actors that say, OK, we're going to get together and make something, we're going to get together and make something, uh, this closed system approach where uh, I am the boss of uh, my own ecosystem, I'm not going to talk to anybody else, uh, that's, uh, that's not going to, um, to continue. I have a little anecdote. It's many years ago, so <laughs> I'll just say it, um, about this type of competition and, uh, and collaboration and, and, and the real effect. I used to work for, for Rolls-Royce, and uh, it was at the, at the time when we won the contract to make the, uh, the engine for the A350. I think. We had a big party and they brought cakes. Uh, we were in future projects, the, the guys that had designed the, uh, the engine, and it was better than General Electric. I said, yes, we had them. Of course, it was an ecosystem thing, but we thought, we are Rolls Royce. We don't collaborate with anyone. We're really, uh, really strong. It's engineering excellence that drives us, and, and so on and so forth. What happened is that we were able to have a very efficient engine uh, because one of our providers had uh, an integrated um, electrical generator that you could mount on the, uh, on the engine shaft directly. So the day after we, uh, we won the bid, General Electric brought, bought that company. <laughs> so it was too late to take away the cakes, but you can imagine how the mood, <laughs> how the mood changed. So it's not really constructive to, to, uh, to continue down, down that line. I think we just end up working hard from sun to sun to do what other men have done, and, uh, and it's inefficient. I do not see a quick way out of it now. We're trying to find ways around it to get people together. Uh, it, it could change in the future, and uh, I have hopes that it will change, but we're still humans, and, and it's a very human thing, too, to want to have a bit more than the others, so collaboration will not be infinite. So we have time for one more quick question. I'm looking, raise a hand. Over here? Over here. Hi, could you comment about the place of a future of bionics? You know what you are talking about? So manufactured manufacturing and robotics. So for example, what Festo was prototyping with last year's. Bionics. Bionics, yes. Okay, that's that's a black swan. <laughs> if you know uh, uh, Nicholas K. Um, it's not things that are being looked at 
very closely by the manufacturing industry today. I know Festo, for example, in Germany uh, runs experiments trying to do biomimicking, rather, but uh, I think that you're talking more about uh, using biological uh, components to manufacture. My, my view on this is that, uh, well, I cannot get my boss to look at that. He says, no, that's never going to work. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I think reality teaches us again and again that it comes much faster than, than we expect. So um, I have an eye on that. I, I think we, um, there are significant uh, uh, regula regulatory problems and, and so on and so forth getting bio into, uh, into the manufacturing industry. I think if these systems become interesting enough, all of that will be ironed out. And you could have a situation where all of today's players are washed away. It's not the first, thing, the first time it happened. So maybe you're talking to, uh, to me today and my days are counted. <laughs> so <laughs> watch that space. I, I know that uh, there are things that are being done. I think it's still far from making an, an impact on manufacturing. But I've made so many predictions about things that could happen in 2050 that have already taken place that um, I wouldn't count it out in, in the near term. Uh, let's thank Gregorio again. Thank you. And we have a small we have a small token of appreciation for your taking the time to come to thank us. Thank you so much.